Hey, if you're watching this video, I'm going to assume that you know what Indonesia is. Just so we're clear, I am talking about the board game, the economics game from Splatter Spellen. In this video, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the rules. This is not a comprehensive toss out the rulebook video. This is meant to work with the rulebook, kind of give you an overview of the game and uh, kind of talk at times in detail about how certain aspects work. But it's to be used in conjunction with the rulebook to answer any specific questions that you might have. Also, before we start, I am using some replacement pieces. The game, the second edition of the game, which is what I have, ships with these oversized wooden tokens. You can use them. The game does come with a little piece of paper that has errata that tells you how you can use these with the game. Um, but I think that's kind of iffy. I don't think it's a great solution. Um, it's unfortunate because these tokens look cool, but they are huge and they are a bit of a pain to use. So instead of using these, I'm using these little plastic cubes I bought online. You can buy a bin of them, it's like 500 cubes in a bunch of different colors for like 10 or $15. It's great, it, it's, I highly recommend it. Uh, you go from these giant pieces to these little cubes and it makes the game way more manageable. Um, I'm also using poker chips instead of the included currency. In most economic games, it's worth it to use different, uh, different money than paper money that might be included with the game. It just makes counting up amounts and stacks of money way easier and way nicer to handle. Um, otherwise, I believe I'm using all of the regular components. If anything else comes up, I'll mention it when it does. So I have the game set up right now um, for five players. Let's take a look. All right, so here it is. Here's Indonesia in all its glory. Like I said, it's set up here for five, but uh, it actually sets up like this regardless of player count. This game doesn't scale to different players, uh, and so you'll always set up this way. Obviously, you'll have fewer player mats with fewer players, but otherwise, it's this way. So I've got all of the A-era companies on the board right now, and they're near the region that they'll be founded in. I've also given every player 100 rupiah, which is the currency of the game, uh, and everyone's also got these A, B, and C era uh, city cards. All right, so the first phase of the round is the new era. You will typically just pass on by this without anything happening, uh, but there are two exceptions to this rule. The first is if there are none of these companies left to be acquired this era, then when you get back to this turn, you will uh, begin a new era of the game. The other exception is if there is only one type of company remaining to be acquired. So if there's only shipping companies left or only rice companies left. If you get to a point where you come into the new era and there's only one type of company remaining to be acquired, you discard those, they will not be acquired, and you move on to the next era. So you go from A to B, B to C, and then uh, at the end of C, when you'd move on to a new era, the game ends. A new era is also done at the very start of the game, so we'll go through that right now. Like I said, each player gets three of these city cards to start the game off. One for era A, one for era B, and one for era C. At the beginning of the game, they will be using the era A card, and then era B and C for the, uh, the appropriate era you know, when it comes up. Each one has a few shaded regions on it, and that player will be able to place a new city, a level one city, in one of those regions, provided there are no cities already there. So on this card, you've got Java Barat, Java Timur, and Bali. At the start of the game, if this is the first player placing, then uh, they will be able to put a city in any of those areas. A level one city is represented by these uh, yellow beads, these yellow glass beads. So you'll take one of those and let's say you want to put it on Bali, right? So if you want to put a city on Bali with that card, you would take that glass bead and you'd place it on one of these two territories in Bali, provinces, I think they're called. So you could put it here or you could place it on that side right there. Once you have that down, that city will be there for the rest of the game. It can level up to a level 2 or a level 3 city, but it will always be there. You cannot get rid of that city, nor can anything else be built on top of it. Once all players have placed cities in the new era, then you'll move on to the next phase. 
Okay, up next is going to be turn order. I randomized the turn order here already at game setup. That initial random turn order is going to be used for putting down the starting cities as well as uh, the order that you bid on turn order in uh, at the start of the game. Going forward, the first person in the turn order will place the starting bid uh, for turn order every, every time you go get to that part of the game. So using the existing turn order, players will put in one bid and the highest bid will go first. Now, you don't have to outbid the person that is currently holding the highest bid. Uh, let's say, for example, the person in first, his first bid place is 10 rupiah, okay? The person in that, that is bidding next doesn't necessarily have to outbid that person. If they don't mind, say, in this example, purple, they don't mind purple going first, but they want to go ahead of another player, they could bid 9, let's say. Uh, hoping that the people they want to go before will be lower than that, but they themselves don't care if they go first. They just want to go before certain players, or maybe they want to go after certain players. Turn order is very important in this game, as it is in many splatter games. What's interesting is where you go in relation to other players is what's important, not in relation to first, second, third, or fourth. You know, it doesn't matter necessarily if you go first as long as you're going before blue, yeah, as, as an example. Any money spent on this turn order bid will go into the bank. You have two, uh, two sections of cash. You have liquid cash, which you'll be using to bid on things and uh, uh, buy things in the game. It's typically what you use. And then you have your bank. Your bank only counts for victory points at the end of the game. And money that you spend here bidding for turn order goes into the bank. So you don't lose it. Uh, so you can kind of feel free to bid a little bit more. Um, knowing that it's still going to help you win at the end of the game. Just don't bid too much or else you won't have money to spend. Okay, so mergers is next. And I am going to get into it right now, but a lot of it doesn't really make a ton of sense without some context. And so I am going to go through the mergers phase now, but I'll also be hitting it again at the end of this video. Uh, because again, context is super important. Anyway, back to the board. All right, so in the mergers phase, you can force merger auctions for any companies of the same type that are currently owned by players, provided you have room in your portfolio for more companies, and uh, if you're the one announcing a merger, that you have the appropriate level of research and development in the mergers track, which you can see over here. So this here is the research and development track. I'll get into detail on this more in the R&D phase of the round, but for the time being, we just need to talk about slots and mergers. Essentially, slots allows you to have more companies in your portfolio. You begin the game only being allowed one. Mergers, on the other hand, allows you to announce the merger of larger companies. At the start of the game, you also only have a uh, level one for mergers, which actually won't let you make any merger announcements. So before you can merge, you have to uh, level up a little bit in that, in that track. To announce a merger, in turn order, players simply announce it. Every eligible player will get a chance to make a merger announcement. In order to be an eligible player, you need to have a certain level of uh, mergers in the R&D track, like I said. That level is at least the number of cardboard deeds in the two merging companies. For example, let's say I want to merge these two shipping companies. There are a total of two deeds in that company. A deed is this cardboard piece. To make this announcement, I would need at least level two in mergers, as, as you can see right here. Once the announcement is made, the announcing player must make a bid. So they must also be able to legally accept that company into their portfolio. In order to take a company into your portfolio, you need open slots in your company. Again, you start the game only having one slot. So if you have a company at this point, you probably won't be able to bid uh, on the companies being merged. The way you can make these bids is either by having a higher slot research, like uh, Orange would have here now, or by already owning one of these two companies that have been announced uh, as merging. 
the announcing player must be able to take the company. So they have to either already own one of these or have uh, more slots uh, in their company. The announcing player makes the first bid. And there are some restrictions as to how much you can bid and how you raise the bid amount. You can't raise it by any amount. The rule book does go over bidding and it has these restrictions listed out on pages five and six. When I loop back around on mergers at the end of this video, I will give an example. Um, but again, context is gonna be valuable, so I'll leave it there for now. Uh, but in summary, an eligible announcing player will take two companies of the same type uh, that players own on the board, any players own, announce that they are merging, and then bidding will begin and it will go around again and again and again until there is one person that holds the highest bid and they will then take the companies. Uh, there is a recommendation of using a multiplication table in this game. It is super handy, it is very quick, and it looks a little wacky, uh, you know, to include just kind of blank white multiplication tables in the game. This is not included in the game, to be clear. I went online and downloaded this, but it makes this whole merging phase a lot quicker and a lot easier. Uh, otherwise, you end up dividing and multiplying a lot of weird numbers. So something to be clear about, too, is the mergers phase will not happen on the first phase of the game because nobody will have high enough mergers, for one, to announce any, and secondly, no one owns any companies at the beginning of the game, and so there will be no companies that could even be announced to merge. Uh, so merging at the earliest will happen in the second round of the game. Cannot happen in the first round. So uh, let's reset the board a little bit in order to set up for the next phase, which is gonna be acquisitions. Okay, in the acquisitions phase, the companies laid out on the board in each era get acquired by any player capable of taking it into their portfolio. All you need is a free slot and any company out here is yours. That's it, it doesn't cost you anything. Once you take a company, you immediately place the associated good or ship onto the board. Goods go in the province, ships go in a sea adjacent to the province marked on the deed. So if you were to take this shipping company, you could place a ship in any sea zone touching this highlighted region, which here would match up to that. So taking this deed would then allow a player to place any of their ships adjacent to that, which could be there, or it could be in that sea zone as well. It would be up to you. If, on the other hand, a player were to take this rice company, they could go ahead, acquire it, and then place, again, I'm using these cubes, uh, the stuff that comes with the game, this is not something that comes with it, but I'm using this to represent a, a rice plantation, uh, and you would take it and put it anywhere in the region highlighted on the deed. So any one of these areas, these provinces divided by these lines, would be eligible for this rice company, because that's what's highlighted here on this deed. If you have trouble finding where the highlighted area is, you can always flip it over and it'll have the name right on the back. In this case, the name matching Java Barat. Okay, now the board may look something like this. There are still a few companies left for players to acquire in the next round, and players have placed ships and plantations of the appropriate type when they acquire a company in the acquisitions phase. Note that these little colored tiddlywinks that I have underneath the plantation cubes are also additions that I've chosen to incorporate into my game. They're not mandatory, they're not included with the game. I use them simply so that people know who owns what. Uh, again, it was a cheap pickup online. Just a little bag of colored tiddlywinks cost something like five bucks. And once companies start to grow in size, it makes it easy to quickly know who owns what. Just, you know, just an option. All right, and we're back. Here's the research and development track again. I'm not gonna go over what every single thing here does. The rule book on page seven does a pretty good job of concisely explaining all of them. In this phase, you simply increase your R&D in any one of these tracks by one, by moving your disc one spot to the right. 
if blue wanted to increase turn order bid, just moves it up. Maybe orange wants to do the same thing. Yellow could go up one in mergers, and uh, maybe red wants to go up in slots. There's one interesting one, though, that I kind of want to point out. The hull player track down here. Not only are you able to increase your own hull player size, but you're also able to increase another player's hull player instead of your own. You cannot move anyone's R&D backwards, nor can you move it up except the hull player track. You can move it up, still can't move it backwards. So if purple, instead of moving one of their discs up a level, they could move, say, red's disc up. What hull player does is allows ships to move more goods in a single round. And so red has a shipping company here and maybe purple wants to be able to ship more goods uh, in the operations phase. So it could behoove them to increase someone else's uh, hull size. Uh, finally, if you're playing the second edition of the game, like I have here, and you can tell if it's the second edition because you have cardboard ships, not wooden ships, then you can just ignore hull company at the bottom down here. Doesn't do anything in the second edition. Okay, I know that's kind of strange, telling you to ignore stuff printed on the board, but with splatter games, you kind of have to get used to that. Honestly, all their games have little oddities in them that uh, you just kind of have to go with. In Indonesia, it is Hull Company. That's a remnant from the first edition of the game and serves no purpose in the second edition. If you're playing second edition, just ignore it. If you do have the first edition, Hull Company is used to match up the, uh, the player color with the shipping companies that are on the board because the ships, the little wooden ships, don't match the colors of the players. And so you need a way to say, you know, the, the red ship is being used by the purple player. That's not the case in second edition. The ship, the cardboard ships, match the color of the players. Um, so I'm, I'm using the second edition again, so I'm going to be ignoring Hull Company. And if you're using second edition, I suggest you ignore it too. Anyway, um, let's move on to the operations phase, which is the fiddliest phase of the whole game. Uh, so we might be here for a minute. Let's check it out. All right, so we've got stuff on the board. People have researched things in R&D. It's now time to move on to operations. This is the phase where you do things with things. In turn order, players must operate all of their companies one at a time. Production companies must sell goods to a city that they can reach, and uh, shipping companies have the option to expand their size. Okay, so if you look over here, you'll see Orange owns a spice company. However, that company is not able to connect to any city on the map right now, because to do so, they must be able to trace a line from their plantation to a city on the map using a chain of ships going through sea zones. As it stands right now, this city cannot connect to this plantation. However, in turn order, purple is going to go before orange, which means this company could end up making a chain to this city, and then when orange's turn comes up, they'll be able to sell. So on Purple's turn, she may wish to expand this ship into this sea zone so that when Orange gets to go, he can use her ships to sell to the city and they'll both make some money. In order to know how much your company can expand by, you'll have to reference the expansion track in the R&D section of the board. Everyone starts off at one, but you can increase that so your company might expand faster every round. For ships, they have a limit to how many ships they can have on the board based on the era of the game they're in. If we look here at Purple's deed for this shipping company, it's got these three numbers, three, four, and five. Those correspond to each era, and that's how many ships that company can have on the map at one time. In era A, it can only have three ships, and right now she's only got one, so expanding here would not be an issue. Her expansion level is only one, and so she would take a ship of the appropriate image and put it in an adjacent region to the ship that uh, is expanding from. So this would be a perfectly legal movement. It does not cost anything for the player. Okay, and that's it for shipping companies. They don't actually do a ton uh, manually on their turn. 
They simply expand for free and that's all a shipping company will do. And for different companies, they'll be able to use the different images uh, in their ship colors. Each player has three different ship images. That's to denote the uh, different companies they might own. Now for Orange here to operate his spice company, he must sell as much as he can to any cities that he can reach. The amount of goods they can sell is equal to the size of the plantation uh, of that company. The plantation level for my game here is going to be the number of cubes that they have uh, on the board for that company. All right, so now that Purple has gone and expanded her shipping empire, Orange is able to sell spice to this city over here. All right, so now that Purple has gone and expanded her shipping empire, Orange is able to sell spice to this city over here. To do so, you will first take a look and see how much spice is worth. Spice is worth 25, as it'll say on the bottom of your little player sheet. So what we'll do is we'll take 25 from the bank and use that to pay the shipping company and then take the rest as profit uh, for selling the spice. So it's $5 per ship used, and you'll do that for every good sold. So this spice is only going to sell one good, but if there were multiple plantations here and it could go to multiple cities or to bigger cities, you'd have to put five bucks down for every good that is being shipped. But in this case, we're just doing one good. So we'll put five dollars here, then we'll put another five here because we need to use both of them to get to this city. That 10 will go to the purple player and the remaining 15 will go to the orange player. Then, for every good sold, we'll put one of these cardboard markers next to the city to indicate that it's been sold to this round. Different size cities can accept different numbers of goods each turn. This level one city can only accept one of each type of good. So this one spice that it's gotten is all it'll get this round. If someone else, or even the same player, wanted to sell spice, it could not go to this city until next round. If it were to get upgraded into a level two city, it would then be able to take two goods, which the back of this has a little two on it to indicate it's been sent to spice. A level three city, understandably, would be able to take a third good of each type. So once that transaction is complete, this city then expands. Again, much like the ships, it's going to be based on the expansion in R&D that that player has. At the start of the game, it's only one, so this plantation will expand one to an adjacent province in that region. Some islands can be expanded to with little arrows pointing to it. That suggests that you can go from this province to this province. However, this island is otherwise landlocked. You cannot jump from here to here or from here over to here. You can only go to adjacent land areas and places where little arrows are pointing. All right, additionally, when expanding production companies, you cannot go into a province that has a city in it. So this company down here in Bali could not expand easterly because there's a city here blocking that, that, uh, that direction. However, they could go toward the, uh, toward the west, continuing to expand through, uh, through these regions. The other restriction for expansion is that production companies can never be adjacent to other production companies. There must always be a provincial buffer zone between the two. For example, if this company over here started to expand in this direction, and this company over here started to expand in this direction, eventually there will be a point where the next placement would be putting them directly adjacent to each other. And that's not a legal move. So in this case, neither of them could go in this middle area because doing so would then, then place them in, uh, in direct adjacency to the other company. So there has to be that buffer zone there. Ships, however, do not have this restriction. There can be multiple ships in the same sea zone and there, there's no issue for that. That's all perfectly fine. Once the operation phase finishes, you move into city growth. You check every city on the map 
and any of them that have been sold the maximum amount of goods they could take in this round based on the state of the board, meaning a level one city has bought every type of good that a player has a production company for, you would then advance that city to the next level city. So in this case, if there's only spice and rice companies on the board, disregard shipping companies, you would then take the city, remove it, and place a level two city in its place. This city down here has purchased rice, but it has not purchased spice, and there are spice companies available on the board. So in that case, this would remain a level one city. So now in future rounds, for this level two city to move on to a level three city, it must buy two of every type of good that players own uh, in that round. So let's say, for example, in the next round, there are still only spice and rice companies on the board. Then the level two city must purchase two rice and two spice in order for it to then advance to level three. Okay, well, that's Indonesia. I think I covered all the big points in the game. Uh, the little bits, a couple little bits, you'll have to reference the rules for. Uh, but the rulebook isn't so bad. It can be a little hard to get through, but it's short. The stuff tends to be listed out in the order that I named it, and things are mostly where you expect them to be. Um, so like I said before, I was going to go back and give an example of mergers. And so uh, I've covered all the rules. If you think that all makes sense, you can stop here. But let's jump back in and cover uh, mergers one more time now that you have the context of the rest of the game. So, mergers. All right, so let's do an example merger here. Let's say we're merging this rice company here, owned by the blue player, with this rice company here, owned by the yellow player. The first thing we need to do is figure out the starting bid for this merger. We do this by taking the number of plantation tokens in this company and adding it to the number of tokens in this company. There are five here, and there are three here, making the total eight. Then, depending on the type of good, you will multiply that by a certain number, that number being the value of that good. At the bottom of a player aid, all these numbers are listed. For ships, you use this one. Transport is not part of that. And then for rice, spice, rubber, sip, fudge, and oil, you use all these. So rice has a value of 20. The eight tokens here in the plantations multiplied by 20 is 160. So the starting bid must be at least 160. Then, going around the table, players that are eligible to take that new company into their portfolio may bid. The amount they must increase their bid by is the number of total plantation cubes in the, the auctioning companies. So, for this example, a starting bid of 160 would then be increased in multiples of 8. So you could go from 160 to 168 to 176 to 184, etc., etc. You cannot do in-betweens, so I could not put a bid of 169 or 211, because those are not multiples of 8. And again, you're limited to multiples of the size of the combined companies, which is going to be measured in how many uh, plantation markers they have put together. You do not have to go up one increment at a time, so you don't have to go from 160 to 168 to 176. You could go from 160 to 272, and then from there to 344. As long as it's a multiple of eight, you can go up any increments you want. As it, but again, it has to be a multiple of the size of the combined plantations. All right, so let's say the winning bid is 168. What do you do with that? How do you deal that money out? Well, you have to divide it fairly between the previous owners of those companies. So you take that 168 and you will have to divide it into uh, five pieces and three pieces. Using the multiplication tables that I had mentioned earlier makes this very easy. You simply look down the column and you'll see that five, uh, five parts of 168 ends up being 105. So you would take 100 
greens being 25 a piece, and five, which then gives the rest to the other player. Now the blue player would take this money, the yellow player would take this money, and then the winning player, in if you're using this tiddlywink system that I mentioned before, would then replace that marker with their own in each company. Now, these companies, the, the areas that they occupy, are separate, but they are considered one company. You stack the deeds like this, and then the purple player would take that into their portfolio as a single company. It's a single company, but it has two deeds in it. That's important because as one company, it only takes one empty slot in their portfolio. But having two deeds means to announce a merger of that company, uh, an announcing player would now need a greater merger rank in R&D. When it comes to merging shipping companies, it's the same sort of process, but at the end, the winner of the auction will replace all of the ships in the newly formed company with their own. Okay, so there's mergers. Hopefully that all makes sense and you can go and um, have a good time founding companies in Indonesia, stealing money from your buddies, uh, tricking them into spending too much on shipping because that happens a lot in Indonesia. It's, ooh boy, is it a pain to spend 25 bucks to ship 20 bucks worth of rice? That's no fun, unless you're the shipper, in which case it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to be getting more than what your buddies are getting for shipping their rice. Um, but yeah, go check it out, Indonesia, great game.